Chapter Twenty, Part Four of Volume Two of A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Volume Two of A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times by Francois Guizot, translated by Robert Black. Chapter Twenty, The Hundred Years' War. Philip the Sixth and John the Second, Part Two. The very day after the battle, the Queen of England came up from Ghent to join the King, her husband, whom his wound confined to his ship, and at Valenciennes, whither the news of the victory speedily arrived, Artevelt, mounting a platform set up in the market place, maintained in the presence of a large crowd the right which the King of England had to claim the kingdom of France. He vaunted the puissance of the three countries, Flanders, Hainault, and Brabant, when at one accord amongst themselves, and what with his words and his great sense, says Froissart, he did so well that all who heard him said that he had spoken mighty well, and with mighty experience, and that he was right worthy to govern the countship of Flanders. From Valenciennes he repaired to King Edward at Bruges, where all the allied princes were assembled and there, in concert with the other deputies from the Flemish communes, Artevelt offered Edward a hundred thousand men for the vigorous prosecution of the war. All these burghers, says the modern historian of the Flemings, had declared that, in order to promote their country's cause, they would serve without pay, so heartily had they entered into the war. The siege of Tournay was the first operation Edward resolved to undertake. He had promised to give this place to the Flemings, the burghers were getting a taste for conquest in company with kings. They found Philip of Valois better informed, and also more hot for war, than perhaps they had expected. It is said that he learned the defeat of his navy at Ecluse from his court fool, who was the first to announce it, and in the following fashion. "'The English are cowards,' said he. "'Why so?' asked the king. "'Because they lacked courage to leap into the sea at Ecluse, as the French and Normans did.' Philip lost no time about putting the places on his northern frontier in a state of defence. He took up his quarters first at Arras, and then three leagues from Tournay, into which his constable, Raoul Doe, immediately threw himself, with a considerable force, and whither his allies, the Duke of Lorraine, the Count of Savoy, the bishops of Liege, Metz, and Verdun, and nearly all the barons of Burgundy came and joined him. On the 27th of July, 1340, he received there from his rival a challenge of portentous length, the principal terms of which are set forth as follows. Philip of Valois, for a long time past we have taken proceedings, by means of messages and other reasonable ways, to the end that you might restore to us our rightful heritage of France, which you have this long while withheld from us, and do most wrongfully occupy. And as we do clearly see that you do intend to persevere in your wrongful withholding, we do give you notice that we are marching against you to bring our rightful claims to an issue. And whereas so great a number of folks assembled on our side and on yours cannot keep themselves together for long without causing great destruction to the people and the country, we desire, as the quarrel is between you and us, that the decision of our claim should be between our two bodies. And if you have no mind to this way, we propose that our quarrel should end by a battle, body to body, between a hundred persons, the most capable on your side and on ours. And if you have no mind, either to one way or to the other, that you do appoint us a fixed day for fighting before the city of Tournay, power to power. Given under our privy seal, on the field near Tournay, the twenty-sixth day of July, in the first year of our reign in France and in England the fourteenth. Philip replied, Philip, by the grace of God, King of France, to Edward, King of England. We have seen your letters brought to our court, as from you to Philip of Valois, and containing certain demands which you make upon the said Philip of Valois. And as the said letters did not come to ourself, we make you no answer. Our intention is, when it shall seem good to us, to hurl you out of our kingdom for the benefit of our people. And of that we have firm hope in Jesus Christ, from whom all power cometh to us. Events were not satisfactory either to the haughty pretensions of Edward or to the patriotic hopes of Philip. The war continued in the north and southwest of France without any result. In the neighborhood of Tournay some encounters in the open country were unfavorable to the English and their allies, 
the siege of the place was prolonged for seventy-four days, without the attainment of any success by assault or investment, and the inhabitants defended themselves with so obstinate a courage, that when at length the King of England found himself obliged to raise the siege, Philip, to testify his gratitude towards them, restored them their law, that is, their communal charter, for some time past withdrawn, and they were greatly rejoiced, says Froissart, at having no more royal governors, and at appointing provosts and jurymen according to their fancy. The Flemish burghers, in spite of their display of warlike zeal, soon grew tired of being so far from their business and of living under canvas. In Aquitaine the lieutenants of the King of France had the advantage over those of the King of England. They retook or delivered several places in dispute between the two crowns, and they closely pressed Bordeaux itself both by land and sea. Edward the aggressor was exhausting his pecuniary resources, and his Parliament was displaying but little inclination to replenish them. For Philip, who had merely to defend himself in his own dominions, any cessation of hostilities was almost a victory. A pious princess, Joan of Valois, sister of Philip and mother-in-law of Edward, issued from her convent at Fontenelle, for the purpose of urging the two kings to make peace, or at least to suspend hostilities. The good dame, says Froissart, saw there, on the two sides, all the flower and honour of the chivalry of the world, and many a time she had fallen at the feet of her brother the King of France, praying him for some respite or treaty of agreement between himself and the English king and when she had laboured with them of France, she went her way to them of the empire, to the Duke of Brabant, to the Marquise of Juillet, and to my Lord John of Hainault, and prayed them for God's and pity's sake, that they would be pleased to hearken to some terms of accord, and would win over the King of England to be pleased to condescend thereto. In concert with the envoys of Pope Benedict the Seventh, Joan of Valois at last succeeded in bringing the two sovereigns and their allies to a truce, which was concluded on the 25th of September, 1340, at first for nine months, and was afterwards renewed on several occasions up to the month of June, 1342. Neither sovereign and none of their allies gave up anything, or bound themselves to anything more than not to fight during that interval, but they were on both sides without the power of carrying on, without a pause, a struggle which they would not entirely abandon. An unexpected incident led to its recommencement in spite of the truce, not, however, throughout France or directly between the two kings, but with fiery fierceness, though it was limited to a single province, and arose not in the name of the kingship of France, but out of a purely provincial question. John the Third, Duke of Brittany, and a faithful vassal of Philip of Valois, whom he had gone to support at Tournay, more stoutly and substantially than any of the other princes, says Froissart, died suddenly at Caen, on the 30th of April, 1341, on returning to his domain. Though he had been thrice married, he left no child. The Duchy of Brittany then reverted to his brothers or their posterity, but his very next brother, Guy, Count of Ponceur, had been dead six years, and had left only a daughter, Joan, called the Cripple, married to Charles of Blois, nephew of the King of France. The third brother was still alive. He too was named John, had from his mother the title of Count of Montfort, and claimed to be the heir to the Duchy of Brittany in preference to his niece Joan. The niece, on the contrary, believed in her own right to the exclusion of her uncle. The question was exactly the same as that which had arisen touching the crown of France, when Philip the Long had successfully disputed it with the only daughter of his brother, Louis the Quarreller. But the Salic law, which had for more than three centuries prevailed in France, had just lately, to the benefit of Philip of Valois, had no existence in the written code, or the traditions of Brittany. There, as in several other great fiefs, women had often been recognized as capable of holding and transmitting sovereignty. At the death of John the Third, his brother, the Count of Montfort, immediately put himself in possession of the inheritance, seized the principal Breton towns, Nantes, Brest, Rennes, and Vannes, and crossed over to England to secure the support of Edward the Third. His rival, Charles of Blois, appealed to the decision of the King of France, his uncle and natural protector. Philip of Valois thus found himself the champion of succession in the female line in Brittany, whilst he was himself reigning in France by virtue of the Salic law, and Edward the Third took up in Brittany the defence of succession in the male line, which he was disputing and fighting against in France. Philip and his court of peers declared on the 7th of September, 1341, that Brittany belonged to Charles of Blois, 
who at once did homage for it to the king of France, whilst John of Montfort demanded and obtained the support of the king of England. War broke out between the two claimants, effectually supported by the two kings, who nevertheless were not supposed to make war upon one another and in their own dominions. The feudal system sometimes entailed these strange and dangerous complications. If the two parties had been reduced for leaders to the two claimants only, the war would not, perhaps, have lasted long. In the first campaign the Count of Montford was made prisoner at the siege of Nantes, carried off to Paris, and shut up in the tower of the Louvre, whence he did not escape until three years were over. Charles of Blois, with all his personal valour, was so scrupulously devout that he often added to the embarrassments, and at the same time the delays of war. He never marched without being followed by his almoner, who took with him everywhere bread and wine and water and fire in a pot, for the purpose of saying mass by the way. One day, when Charles was accordingly hearing it, and was very near the enemy, one of his officers, Offroy de Montboucher, said to him, "'Sir, you see right well that your enemies are yonder, and you halt a longer time than they need to take you.' "'Offroy,' answered the prince, "'we shall always have towns and castles, and if they are taken we shall, with God's help, recover them. But if we miss hearing of mass we shall never recover it.' Neither side, however, had much detriment from either the captivity or pious delays of its chief. Joan of Flanders, Countess of Montfort, was at Rennes when she heard that her husband had been taken prisoner at Nantes. Although she made great mourning in her heart, says Froissart, she made it not like a disconsolate woman, but like a proud and gallant man. She showed to her friends and soldiers a little boy she had, and whose name was John, even as his father's, and she said to them, Ah! Sirs, be not discomforted and cast down because of my lord whom we have lost. He was but one man. See, here is my little boy, who, please God, shall be his avenger. I have wealth in abundance, and of it I will give you an ell, and I will provide you with such a leader as shall give you all fresh heart. She went through all her good towns and fortresses, taking her young son with her, reinforcing the garrisons with men and all they wanted, and giving away abundantly wherever she thought it would be well laid out. Then she went her way to hennebon sur mer which was a strong town and strong castle, and there she abode, and her son with her, all the winter. In May 1342 Charles of Blois came to besiege her, but the attempts at assault were not successful. The Countess of Montfort, who was cased in armour and rode on a fine steed, galloped from street to street through the town, summoned the people to defend themselves stoutly, and called on the women, dames, damoiselles, and others to pull up the roads, and carry the stones to the ramparts to throw down on the assailants. She attempted a bolder enterprise. She sometimes mounted a tower right up to the top, that she might see the better how her people bore themselves. She one day saw that all they of the hostile army, lords and others, had left their quarters and gone to watch the assault. She mounted her steed, all armed as she was, and summoned to horse with her about three hundred men-at-arms who were on guard at a gate which was not being assailed. She went out thereat with all her company and threw herself valiantly upon the tents and quarters of the lords of France, which were all burned, being guarded only by boys and varlets, who fled as soon as they saw the countess and her folk entering and setting fire. When the lords saw their quarters burning and heard the noise which came therefrom, they ran up all dazed and crying, "'Betrayed! Betrayed!' so that none remained for the assault. When the countess saw the enemy's host running up from all parts, she reassembled all her folk, and seeing right well that she could not enter the town again without too great loss, she went off by another road to the castle of Brest, or more probably Dare, as Brest is much more than three leagues from Hennebon, which lies as near as three leagues from thence. Though hotly pursued by the assailants, she rode so fast and so well that she and the greater part of her folks arrived at the castle of Brest, where she was received and feasted right joyously. Those of her folks who were in Hennebon were all night in great disquietude, because neither she nor any of her company returned, and the assailant lords, who had taken up quarters near to the town, cried, "'Come out, come out, and seek your countess. She is lost. You will not find a bit of her.' In such fear the folks in Hennebon remained five days." but the countess wrought so well that she had now full five hundred comrades armed and well mounted. Then she set out from Brest about midnight and came away, arriving at sunrise and riding straight upon one of the flanks of the enemy's host. 
There she had the gate of Hennebon Castle opened, and entered in with great joy and a great noise of trumpets and drums, whereby the besiegers were roughly disturbed and awakened. The joy of the besieged was short. Charles of Blois pressed on the siege more rigorously every day, threatening that, when he should have taken the place, he would put all the inhabitants to the sword. Consternation spread even to the brave, and a negotiation was opened with a view of arriving at terms of capitulation. By dint of prayers, Countess Joan obtained a delay of three days. The first two had expired, and the besiegers were preparing for a fresh assault, when Joan, from the top of her tower, saw the sea covered with sails. "'See, see!' she cried, "'the aid so much desired!' Every one in the town, as best they could, rushed up at once to the windows and battlements of the walls to see what it might be, says Froissart. In point of fact it was a fleet, with six thousand men brought from England to the relief of Hennebon by Amore de Clisson and Walter de Mani, and they had been a long while detained at sea by contrary winds. When they had landed the countess herself went to them and feasted them and thanked them greatly, which was no wonder, for she had sore need of their coming. It was far better still when, next day, the new arrivals had attacked the besiegers and gained a brilliant victory over them. When they re-entered the place, whoever, says Froissart, saw the countess descend from the castle and kiss my lord Walter de Mani and his comrades, one after another, two or three times, might well have said that it was a gallant dame. All the while that the Count of Montfort was a prisoner in the Tower of the Louvre, the countess his wife strove for his cause with the same indefatigable energy. He escaped in 1345, crossed over to England, swore fealty and homage to Edward III for the Duchy of Brittany, and immediately returned to take in hand, himself, to his own cause. But in the very year of his escape, on the 26th of September, 1345, he died at the castle of Hennebon, leaving once more his wife with a young child, alone at the head of his party, and having in charge the future of his house. The Countess Joan maintained the rights and interests of her son, as she had maintained those of her husband. For nineteen years she, with the help of England, struggled against Charles of Blois, the head of a party growing more and more powerful, and protected by France. Fortune shifted her favors and her asperities from one camp to the other. Charles of Blois had, at first, pretty considerable success, but on the 18th of June, 1347, in a battle in which he personally displayed a brilliant courage, he was in his turn made prisoner, carried to England, and immured in the Tower of London. There he remained nine years. But he too had a valiant and indomitable wife, Joan of Penthevre the Cripple. She did for her husband all that Joan of Montfort was doing for hers. All the time that he was a prisoner in the Tower of London, she was the soul and the head of his party, in the open country as well as in the towns, turning to profitable account the inclinations of the Breton population, whom the presence and the ravages of the English had turned against John of Montfort and his cause. She even convoked at Dinan in 1352, a general assembly of her partisans, which is counted by the Breton historians as the second holding of the states of their country. During nine years, from 1347 to 1356, the two Joans were the heads of their parties in politics and in war. Charles of Blois at last obtained his liberty from Edward III on hard conditions, and returned to Brittany to take up the conduct of his own affairs. The struggle between the two claimants still lasted eight years, with vicissitudes ending in nothing definite. In 1363 Charles of Blois and young John of Montfort, weary of the fruitless efforts and the sufferings of their countries, determined both of them to make peace and share Brittany between them. Rennes was to be Charles's capital, and Nantes that of his rival. The treaty had been signed, an altar raised between the two armies, and an oath taken on both sides, but when Joan of Penthevre was informed of it, she refused downright to ratify it. I married you, she said to her husband, to defend my inheritance, and not to yield the half of it. I am only a woman, but I would lose my life, and two lives if I had them, rather than consent to any session of the kind. Charles of Blois, as weak before his wife, as brave before the enemy, broke the treaty he had but just sworn to, and set out for Nantes to resume the war. "'My lord,' said Countess Joan to him in presence of all his knights, "'you are going to defend my inheritance and yours, "'which my lord of Montfort, wrongfully God knows, doth withhold from us, "'and the barons of Brittany who are here, present, "'know that I am rightful heiress of it. 
I pray you affectionately not to make any ordinance, composition, or treaty, whereby the duchy corporate remain not ours. Charles set out, and in the following year, on the 29th of September, 1364, the Battle of Aray cost him his life and the Countship of Brittany. When he was wounded to death, he said, I have long been at war against my conscience. At the sight of his dead body on the field of battle, young John of Montfort, his conqueror, was touched, and cried out, Alas, my cousin, by your obstinacy, you have been the cause of great evils in Brittany. May God forgive you. It grieves me much that you are come to so sad an end. After this outburst of generous compassion came the joy of victory, which Montfort owed above all to his English allies, and to John Chandos, their leader, to whom, my lord John, said he, this great fortune path come to me through your great sense and prowess. Wherefore, I pray you, drink out of my cup. Sir, answered Chandos, let us go hence, and render you our thanks to God for this happy fortune you have gotten, for without the death of yonder warrior you could not have come into the inheritance of Brittany. From that day forth John of Montfort remained in point of fact Duke of Brittany, and Joan of Penthevra, the cripple, the proud princess who had so obstinately defended her rights against him, survived for full twenty years the death of her husband and the loss of her duchy. End of chapter 20, part 4